We'll be returning to our train later in the programme, but first, a reminder about the difference between speed and velocity. Cars travelling north can have the same speed as cars moving south. However, it's impossible for two cars to have the same velocity if they are moving in different directions. A car travelling at 20 metres per second north has the same speed as a car travelling at 20 metres per second south, but they have different velocities because they are going in different directions. Speed is distance divided by time. This can take place in any direction and it's called a scalar quantity. Velocity is displacement divided by time. It takes place in a given direction. This is called a vector quantity. Acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity. So we get an acceleration whenever we have a change in velocity. We need two parameters to define velocity, magnitude and direction. If the magnitude changes, say from 20 metres per second to 25 metres per second, the car has accelerated. But what happens if the speed remains constant and the direction changes? This is also a change in velocity, and so we have an acceleration. At this point, the train is heading in this direction. Now the train is here and heading in this direction. There has clearly been a change in direction, hence a change in velocity and therefore an acceleration. But what caused the train to change direction? The answer to that question is provided by Newton's first law of motion. Everybody will continue to move in a straight line or remain at rest unless a resultant force acts upon it. In the case of the train, the resultant force is caused by the reaction of the track on the wheels. Here is a simple device to detect acceleration. It is made from two glass plates with some coloured liquid in between. If the accelerometer is at rest, or moving with constant velocity, then the liquid level is horizontal. But if its velocity is changing, then the surface tilts. The accelerometer has been calibrated and is mounted on an air track vehicle. A resultant force, that's the weight on the left, is applied to the vehicle and it accelerates. In this still shot, the liquid level shows an acceleration which is towards the left. The accelerometer has now been mounted to one arm of a children's roundabout. Notice the level of the liquid as it goes past. When we freeze the picture, it's clear that there's again an acceleration to the left. This is towards the centre of the roundabout. The acceleration shown is greater on the roundabout than on the air track. What do you think will happen if the accelerometer is mounted tangentially on the roundabout? Notice the liquid level as it goes past. The level is horizontal. There is no acceleration when moving at constant speed around the circumference of the roundabout. In the following examples, see if you can identify the resultant force which causes the circular motion.
Newton's second law of motion. A resultant force acting on a mass produces an acceleration. This acceleration is in the same direction as the applied force. We'll now take a closer look at one of the examples we've just seen. The tension in the thread causes circular motion because it pulls the puck inwards all the time. This inward resultant force prevents the puck travelling off at a tangent to the circle. This centre-seeking force is called the centripetal force and in the case of the puck on the air table is caused by the tension in the thread. Here the thread has been released. You will see that without the centripetal force acting on it, the puck travels in a straight line. We'll see that again. An object moving in a circle at constant speed changes direction, therefore its velocity changes. Its acceleration is towards the centre or centripetal and must be caused by an overall centripetal force if circular motion is to be maintained. For an object of mass m to move at speed v in a circle of radius r, a force of size mv squared over r must be provided towards the centre.